By some calculations, it had not been since the War of 1812 that the United States military had such a unique opportunity fall into its lap. Nearly 122 years after that conflict, at 11.09 on the 4th of June, 1944, the American Hunter-Killer Task Group 22.3 made contact with German submarine U-505 near Cape Verde in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Following a brief skirmish in which the U-boat took fire from torpedoes, depth charges, and hedgehog mortars, the badly damaged German vessel was forced to surface. The German crew took orders from their captain to abandon and scuttle U-505, but in the confusion that followed, it seemed that not all of the correct valves had been opened to totally flood the submarine. Instead, U-505 spun in a slow circle on the surface as its engine continued running and its rudder stuck in a deflected position. The sailors of TG-22.3 quickly recognized the possibility of recovering secret documents and codes, and they boarded the German U-boat to seize whatever they could get their hands on. Once in control of U-505, the Americans further realized that it wasn't going to sink after all. Instead, they would claim a prize that had not been won in over a century and would tow the enemy submarine back to Bermuda. The feat, the capture of an enemy warship, would allow the United States to analyze the cryptic Enigma machines on board and gain valuable intelligence that would bring the end of World War II one step closer. U-505 was laid down in June of 1940 by shipbuilding Hamburg company Deutsche Werft. The vessel was launched the following May and was commissioned on the 26th of August. U-505 had a troubled and unlucky history that lasted throughout several captains. Captain Lieutenant Axel Olaf Lowe was put in command, but was later removed for Commander Zeck. He was in control for most of the ship's career, but was eventually replaced by Oberlieutenant Zorsee Paul Meyer. Meyer served for only two weeks in command, and was replaced by Oberlieutenant Zorze Harald Lange, who served until the submarine was captured by the Americans. Throughout its career, the ship went on 12 patrols. It sank a surprising eight ships, sending over 44,962 tons of material to the bottom of the ocean. Three of those eight ships were American, two were British, and the rest were Norwegian, Dutch, and Colombian. On the submarine's fourth patrol, it went to the northern coast of Venezuela, where it sank the British steam merchant Ocean Justice. Just three days later, a Lockheed Hudson Maritime Patrol aircraft dropped a bomb on a U-boat near Trinidad. The 250-pound bomb hit the deck above the water level and injured two crew members. The anti-aircraft gun jumped out of its mounting and caused damage to the pressor hull. Still, the aircraft was hit by flying fragments from the explosion and sank in the ocean. After the attack, the U-505 was left with inoperative pumps and significant flooding of the engine room. At the time, the captain lieutenant gave the order to abandon ship. Still, the staff, led by Chief Petty Officer Otto Frick, decided to save the German U-boat. The vessel was taken to Lorient on reduced power. The submarine underwent two entire weeks of repair work before being selected for an additional six months of work. After that affair, the ship became the, quote, most damaged U-boat to successfully return to port in the entire war. In July, the U-505 was sent out again, but returned 13 days later. It was attacked by three British destroyers that followed it for 30 hours. Although it did not receive significant damage, it was still sent to France for repairs. The following four patrols only lasted a couple of days each due to equipment failure induced by rebellious French dock workers supporting the resistance. Sabotaged parts included electrical and radar equipment, as well as a hole purposely drilled into the diesel fuel tank. The issue was recurring upon every return to port. After one of the cancelled patrol missions, one of the crew members located a sign in the docking area that read, quote, U-505's hunting ground. The commander himself became the butt of the joke among sailors, with many pointing out that no matter what, he always returned to port. After ten months of repairs at Lorient, the submarine was sent to the Atlantic, where it was spotted and pursued by British destroyers. The crew had to undergo a severe depth charge, 
where the commander reportedly grew increasingly distressed. With low morale, the ship's commander, Zhek, took a drastic measure against himself. While the submarine and crew returned to port, the commander did not. The pressure of six dysfunctional patrol missions had gotten to him. Through decrypted messages, the Allies learned that the Germans were operating U-boats by Cape Verde. Not only had these submarines been a nightmare for their vessels, but the prospect of capturing and dissecting German technology was desirable. The American Navy sent Task Group 22.3 to Cape Verde. This group included the aircraft carrier USS Guadalcanal, along with five destroyers, USS Chatelaine, Flaherty, Jenks, Pillsbury, and Pope. They traveled from Norfolk in Virginia, halfway through May of 1944, and arrived at the end of the month. They used high-frequency direction-finding fixes to try locating the U-boats. Extensive air and surface reconnaissance was also conducted. Getting visuals of the U-boats during daylight was potentially rather easy. The U-boats were a bit less submarine than modern subs. They couldn't stay underwater for more than 8 or 12 hours. They were like surface ships, with the additional ability to submerge for stealthy attacks. If a U-boat remained underwater for over 12 hours, it risked killing the crew because carbon dioxide would build up. The engines would also fail in such a scenario as the German subs needed fresh air. To limit exposure and reduce the likelihood of being attacked, the Germans used retractable snorkels. These allowed the submarine to remain below the surface while the diesel engines ran and the batteries recharged. At that point, however, the U-boats were at their most vulnerable. U-505 returned from its 11th patrol on the 2nd of January 1944 after rescuing over 30 crew members of the German T-25 torpedo boat. The crew set out on the vessel's 12th and most tragic patrol in the summer. The fateful capture of the U-boat began at 11.09 on the 4th of June 1944. Task Group 22.3 located the U-boat through sonar, about 150 nautical miles away from the coast of Rio de Oro. The USS Chatelaine was only 800 yards away from it. The escort sped towards the submarine, while the USS Guadalcanal pushed to maximum speed as it released a Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighter aircraft. Another Wildcat and a General Motors Grumman Avenger torpedo bomber were already flying out towards the target. Still a few miles from the coast of Western Sahara, the U-boat underwent depth charge attacks from the USS Chatelaine. These attacks jammed the submarine's rudder, disabled the auxiliary rudder controls, and flooded the aft compartments. The dire situation forced the vessel to the surface, only to receive more naval gunfire. The conditions seemed to indicate that the ship would sink, so Commanding Officer Lang gave the order to abandon ship. They could only carry out the standard scuttling procedures partially before they were captured. The U-505 was taken by personnel from the USS Pillsbury. Its commander, Lieutenant Junior Grade Albert L. David, secured the sensitive materials aboard the German submarine. He led his team to shut the scuttling valves and disarming the charges. He was awarded the Medal of Honor after the fact for his role in the capture. The flooding was managed, and the diesel engines were turned off. The U-boat was towed to Bermuda after the appropriate damage control actions were carried out. It arrived on the 19th of June. Among the valuable intelligence items collected were classified documents, code books, communications equipment, and an incredibly useful Enigma cipher machine with up-to-date cipher rotors. The German Enigma cipher machine patented in 1918 by Arthur Scherbius and introduced into the German Navy in 1926 was an advanced and extremely difficult to crack device that underwent constant changes. The machine recovered from U-505 was only one of three captured by the Allies during the Second World War. As for the submarine, it was one of only six U-boats the Allies captured during the war and the first warship captured by the United States in 122 years. The visible salvage needed to be hidden to fully exploit the intelligence gathered from the capture. The U.S. Navy needed to make it seem like the U-boat had sunk rather than getting captured. If the Germans had discovered the truth, they would have acted upon the loss of their Enigma machine, and the Navy could not afford to let that happen.
the American Navy needed to maintain the illusion that the U-505 had been sunk while it was conducting its analysis. To get away with this, they decided to repaint the vessel and name it USS Nemo, while it was stationed at the U.S. Naval Operating Base in Bermuda. The ship was put to further use by the U.S. Navy in the immediacy of the war's end. It was put on display to promote the e-war bond sales. If someone purchased a bond, they gained the right to enter the ship and inspect it. The exhibition tour was launched in Washington, D.C. in June of 1945, for which Captain Gallery was present. U-505 was then displayed in this manner in New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Once the war was over, the U.S. Navy no longer needed the captured U-505. The ship was examined thoroughly at Bermuda by a group of experts. Afterward, it was moored at the Portsmouth Navy Yard in New Hampshire. At the time, the Navy decided to use the vessel as a target for torpedoes and guns. However, Rear Admiral Gallery did not approve of the plan and contacted his brother in 1954 about it. Gallery was put in touch with the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry President Lennox Lohr to see if the ship could be taken there. Since the Chicago Museum was planning a submarine display, the prospect of acquiring the U-505 was incredibly enticing. By September of that year, the U.S. government agreed to donate the submarine. Payment for relocation came from Chicago residents, who raised $250,000 for transport and installation. The boat was tugged through the Great Lakes by Coast Guard tugs and cutters. After a brief stop in Detroit, the U-505 finally arrived at its resting place. The museum placed it on permanent display as part of an exhibit and memorial for all the sailors lost in the First and Second Battle of the Atlantic. Since the boat's interior had been ripped out before relocation, the director had to additionally obtain refurbishments before opening the exhibit. The original German manufacturers were contacted and contracted to replace the boat's original components and pieces. They all handed over replacement parts for free, only desiring that full technological credit go to Germany. The periscope was taken out and put in a water tank at the Arctic Submarine Laboratory in Point Loma, California, for research purposes by the Navy. When that lab was demolished in 2003, the Navy collected the periscope and sent it to the museum. The next year, the U-505 was moved to a climate-controlled place and sent for renovations. It was once more shown to the public starting in June of 2005. In 2019, it was refurbished to look even more exactly like it did during its glory days. <laughs> 